Hello, how is it going? My name is Fake Hero and welcome to my 2022 deck building guide for Legends of Runeterra. This video is going to be perfect for beginners. So if you're just getting into the game or are relatively new to card games, this video is going to be perfect for you. Now I've hit Masters, the highest ranks in Legends of Runeterra, multiple seasons in a row now since almost the dawn of time. I'm relatively good at deck building. Most of the time I personally spend uh, teching decks more than building fresh archetypes. But I feel I'm more, I'm more than confident in teaching you guys, you know, the, the fundamental steps and how to build a good deck and like actually build a competitive deck, I mean, because there's a difference between building fun decks and then building fun decks that are good. So I'm going to give you the right tools to be able to do that, guys. Uh, if this video was useful at all, a like is greatly appreciated. Uh, chapters to each section is down below. If you need to find something specific, go for it. Have a great day. Before we go too in depth with this, I will firstly just make you guys understand what the deck building rules are. So for standard rules, a deck built with 40 cards can contain a maximum of two regions, six champion cards in total, and only three copies of each card. Note that, so because it gets a little bit confusing now because we kind of have this new region called Bandle City, and Bandle City semi, it doesn't really break the rules, but in terms of some of the Bandle City champions, uh, they are actually going to have multi-regions and what that means with the multi-region is that they can go into either region and you still have the ability to splash that extra region but you can't play three regions so for example if I wanted to build a deck with Ziggs I could either do Sharima Bandle and then use Shuriman and Bandle City cards only or you could do Shuriman plus any other region and only those two regions if that makes sense so Bandle City was pretty cool when it came out kind of brought out this new multi-region combo thing but yeah still follows the same rules only two regions you just get the flexibility of choosing what regions you'd like to splash other than that there's also going to be some cards that you cannot main deck uh, basically they're just uncollectible cards in a sense and but if it helps and you want to know where some of these cards may or may not have come from there's a couple of mechanics as celestials celestials are cards that are created by the invoke mechanic they can't be added to your deck there's also the emperor's deck probably not super relevant it's like a zero level three when he's super ascended and changes your deck to that one and there's also going to be mecha yordles which are manifested by various other cards they can't be added to your deck as well so important to note them there you can build decks around celestials if you like you just need to be putting cards into your deck that have the invoke mechanic and same with mecha yordles you just need to add cards that can manifest mecha yordles but now that we've got that out of the way let's get into some of the more in-depth topics so firstly when it comes to deck building 101 i'm going to give you a few rules that you kind of want to follow before you even start thinking about a deck well at the, while you're thinking about the deck right uh so number one it's probably going to be the most important that you identify a win condition whether it be a singular card or multiple cards that you want to push towards and kind of have your deck close out games with x y and uh, z and then number two to support those win conditions we're going to need uh, supporting cards slash some synergies and to combo on top of the synergy aspect of this number three is to uh, synergize but don't over synergize so look for synergies but don't over synergize because uh, the problem with having a deck that's too synergistic is that you're not going to have some really good tools to usually balance out the early game to kind of keep your deck staple and flowing. Uh, not every deck needs to have over the top craziness. You need to make sure you're slotting in cards like for example in this deck here. Uh, Poker Stick, these are just very vanilla effects that are just overall really powerful. This is a deal one to anything and draw one. Another example of just cards that are just like relatively good in their regions is like a Mystic Shot, a deal two to anything. Uh, usually the less synergistic cards that become staples end up being a lot of spells I've noticed. So it's important that your deck has like, they don't have to be cheap and every region has their respective staple cards, but it's important that you put in these cards because you don't want to make a deck too synergistic because most of the times, although those cards aren't very good on their own, and it's important that you have a nice balance between like your win condition, your supporting cards, and then having some of those like less synergistic but staple cards. And number four, uh, not always going to be the most relevant and it really depends on what kind of deck you're building, but tech. You need to tech your deck towards certain metas. There's always going to be those powerful tier one decks that just like, 
usually can have some weaknesses if you take your deck appropriately. Um, an example might not be shown in this deck, but in general, and what that might be like running some removal to get rid of big threats your opponent might have. That might be healing to kind of stop those aggro decks from smoking you down. There's multiple different ways of looking towards tech, but just important to kind of note what's popular and then thinking about cards that might be able to take that deck down. You don't want to overtake your deck though. It's usually good to have a couple, uh, but not always super relevant. Specifically, you'll see techs more in the control decks and the slower decks because they can get away with playing cards like that a lot more than the more faster decks. So in many card games, you're going to hear about deck archetypes. So you're going to hear some of the four most, four common words you're going to hear of. And if this doesn't make sense to you, let me explain it to you. One, aggro. Two, mid-range. Three, combo. Four, control. These are like the most common deck archetypes you're going to see in almost any card game, right? Runeterra is pretty unique though. So I want to get I want to put, get this point across to you guys. Is that Runeterra is very unique in your deck builds because unlike a lot of other card games, I think every single one of these four things that is mentioned um, isn't actually super relevant. Uh, building good decks doesn't mean sticking to like making sure your deck is purely aggro or making sure it's purely control. There's like this fine line where tempo is super important. What that means is like if you're playing a control deck, it doesn't need to be like super removal heavy, super greedy. It needs to actually have some decent early game. You want to actually be curving out. Curve is very good, very powerful. Playing units on curve is one of the best control things you can do. <laughs> but um, yeah, not to point to put that point across for a second, there is still going to be a fundamental archetype that you follow. You want your deck to make a relatively amount of sense. Like we already talked about the Yordle deck and it's relatively an aggro deck with some pretty juicy uh, value cards on the end. So we, we play a fair bit more early game than we do in other uh, control decks. But to give you an example of like a control deck right here, like the darkness deck, kind of like a control deck with some combo aspects. But yeah, we play a fair bit of top end removal, but we've still got units to play on curve. Concologist, Acolyte, into Stilted uh, stilted Robe Maker. We have some decent early game drops. Now, this is probably not the best example because these early game drops also act to push our win condition and they have a fair bit of synergy, but you'll see this very common in lots of control decks. So we do want to be curving out playing units. So we're not forced into using our premium cards to remove our opponent's threats. We can be fighting for the board. And I think tempo and board state is very important in Runeterra. So be mindful of that when you're building decks is to make sure you're including a good ratio of um, units and spells, even landmarks as well, if that's a thing. But to have a good ratio, you don't want to flood your deck with too many spells. You don't want to flood your decks with too many units. You need to have a nice combination of both. And to follow up on that, uh, ratios. So you're going to hear this term like a lot, maybe not a lot, but people talk a lot about like ratioing deck and how you should have like two of this or three of that or one of that. I think that's all just kind of like baloney. I think it makes sense to play more copies of the most powerful cards and less copies of the more uh, niche slash tech cards, right? Uh, an example, for example, let's look at the Star Spring deck here. This is a deck that's revolved around healing, a landmark Star Spring, and uh, getting to X amount of healing to meet that requirement. This deck plays a lot of three ofs, right? This deck needs to have very specific cards though, so playing more copies of three of each makes a lot more sense because we're playing the most premium cards that follow that win condition. So that's why we play three of that. You wanna play more copies of the cards that make sense and less of the ones that don't, guys. It's pretty simple. Tech cards, protection tools, stuff like Bastion, we don't play as many copies of because they can obviously brick a lot easier. So, you know, play less of the cards that are gonna brick your hand and more of the cards that aren't going to brick your hand. I hope that kind of makes sense, but yeah, you might hear a lot of people talking to about ratioing deck just kind of follow the rule set that's like play more copies of cards that don't brick and play less is less copies of cards that can brick or require a lot more specific scenarios. Alrighty guys, just in a moment, we're actually going to build a deck in this video and kind of go through, th uh, through some of the thought processes I have there. But I just wanted to say really quickly, if you have time, if you want to, check out my Twitch stream. Um, if you have, like, if you want to come in there and share your decks with me, I can give you some advice on them 
live, whatever works for you. If not, if I missed anything or if you have any further questions about any topic topics, guys, do not hesitate to like leave them in the comments or ask me. Contact me any way you can. I'm here to help. And I know like deck building is a very um, tough thing to learn. So asking questions, whatever it may be, please guys, come to my Twitch, uh, Twitch stream, leave them in the comments below, join the Discord, whatever it takes. I'm here to help you guys. Don't hesitate. Let's continue. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to actually build a deck with you guys here. And to do that, obviously, a lot of the most popular archetypes, meta decks, they've already been built. So I'm going to try and build a deck with one of the worst cards in the game right now, which is going to be Aphelios. Now, just because this card is like pretty damn bad, doesn't mean we can't try and build the most competitive deck possible with Aphelios. So first of all, uh, Aphelios is also going to be kind of like our win condition because He's a very interesting card in, in the terms of that obviously A, he's a champion, which tend to be a lot more powerful than followers, but B, he, he's like a massive value generator, which can uh, also give you a lot of flexible options for uh, proceeding to do uh, very well in your games. So he can kind of act as like your win condition slash your value generator, which kind of gives me the idea that this deck wants to be a bit more of a slow control deck, having Aphelios to kind of act as our win condition and kind of helping us to stabilize the early game. In theory, he's kind of he's kind of slow these days. He used to be really strong, but they nerfed him to the ground. First thing I want to do is maybe consider a secondary champion alongside this. And the first thing I want to do in to combo with that is like look at the regions that Aphelios is in, which is Targon, and consider some of the champions in this region firstly. Um, and I think a good example is going to be something like Dinah, which comes with some Nightfall synergy, which Aphelios also has as well as like kind of having the ability to also be like acting as removal in the early game to help stabilize it a lot more because Targon typically suffers uh, from removal. This is a very like slow control region that doesn't have access to the best forms of removal. So I think Dinah is really good in supporting Aphelios in that way. Now, next thing I want to do is maybe consider a secondary region. Even before I go towards my supporting cards. I want to consider the secondary region and maybe think about what my deck wants to do. And I think a good example for a deck splash is going into Shadow Isles to kind of like fix Targon's weaknesses, which is typically removal. Now Shadow Isles has access to some of the most premium removal options. An example being uh, Vengeance, very good tech, very good, just stable card from this region. Let's try putting in three copies of Vengeance. And obviously this is not like, there's no real way to order this. I kind of like when I'm deck building, I just kind of start thinking about ideas and then kind of going from one thing to another and kind of backtracking a little bit. So I think what I want to do now between Targon and Shadow Isles, I maybe want to consider looking at some of the Nightfall cards to give Dino a little bit of synergy without being too over synergistic. And then maybe looking for some of the Nightfall staples, maybe looking for some of the staples in general. So I think a, a good card to consider here is Lunari Duskbringer. When she's summoned, she gives you the Dusk Petal, which the next Nightfall unit you play is around costs one less. This card makes a lot of sense in this deck. Let's add three copies of it in. Pale Cascade is a really good staple, even outside of Nightfall. This should definitely be a three of as well. We could obviously come back and change some of the numbers, but for now, I'm going to splash in as many as I can think of. Next, I might consider some more value tools. Might add in some Lunari Priestess. Really cool because she has like the Nightfall as well as having some Invoke Synergy. Uh, not Synergy, but Invoking like give us a lot more tools to kind of like win the game and kind of turn this into more of a flexible uh, control deck. And as we're doing that, I'm looking at some of the other Nightfall cards here and thinking to myself that maybe not a lot of these are making a lot of sense. Like I could add in some more Nightfall synergy to try and boost Dinah, but I don't think that's going to be super necessary. As as I said, Dinah kind of will act as more of like the early game removal where if we do get some bonus effects from granting Nightfall with her to give her some more challenges, like that would be great. But realistically, we don't want to over synergize the deck. We need to make sure we're putting in good substance and good cards that can help us to push our win condition. Now, I want to kind of backtrack here a little bit and maybe look at some of our other removal options as well as having some considerable techs. Now, I think Hush and Targon, 
this is a very good card just in general. It's just a very flexible tech card that isn't too targetable, but it's good to have. Silencing uh, or silencer unit this round can be very powerful for slowing down your opponent or allowing you to do some really good tricks to kind of kill your opponent's key units. Uh, some other removal options that make a lot of sense are, I think at the moment, the box is a fantastic card. I definitely want to add some of that in. This card will deal three to each enemy that will summon this round. It's a very powerful removal tool that in Shadow Isles that can sometimes blow out your opponent on the spot. I like these very niche removals as a one of like the box, like having multiples of this is easily brickable. Uh, some cards are better left with lower numbers because their impact greatly diminishes if they're too, uh, too specific and the box is a very specific card. So I don't want to flood my deck too much with that. Uh, going through a list, there's some really good staple cards in Targon, like I haven't mentioned yet, but like Spacey Sketcher is like a very good staple card. You can play uh, play to discard one card, which is a bit of a downside to invoke a Celestial, it costs three or less. Uh, Targon is really good at having these like invoker cards that are very flexible in your game plan and can provide you, provide you like multiple answers to what you might need. Uh, some of the invoke cards could be giving you more card draw, giving you some elusive damage, uh, giving you some protection tools. Space Sketch is really nice and has like a little bit of synergy here with being able to like discard the Dusk Petal if we don't need it to summon uh, the Spacey Sketcher. So I do like putting the Spacey Sketcher in. Uh, we'll go ahead, we'll keep scrolling down the list here because I think there's some other good removal tools we might want. Uh, Withering Whale notoriously is a very good removal tool against aggro this card alone by itself has the ability to just kind of like shut down aggro completely as well as cards like vile feast uh vile feast is really good because like it can kind of like in the early game clear one of your opponent's units as well as summoning a blocker vile feast is typically just a very good staple card from shadow isles it's just it's extremely powerful we also drain one too so we get a little bit of healing a really nuts card and there's a mechanic in the game called uh, spell shield where they negate the first spell that hits them. So if you want to try and remove something big with Vengeance, you might need to be able to pop the Spell Shield and Vile Feast alongside Vengeance as three orbs each is like very good in Shadow Isles. Oh, so we've gone 28 out of 40 cards. We're already getting quite close to like filling up our deck. It doesn't really take long when you're limited to 40 cards. So it's probably important to start finding some, probably with a deck like this, Another win condition, I think a good uh, example of a win condition in Targon is definitely star shaping. Uh, you'll invoke a Celestial cost seven or more and then heal an ally or your Nexus four. Just extremely powerful card, right? And especially if you're in Targon, it's just kind of nuts and it can give you a win condition out of nowhere through some of the Celestials. And I'll quickly show you guys some of these Celestial cards, right? So Celestials, and we're gonna invoke one that costs seven or more. You've got some pretty ridiculous cards over on the top end, like a Mortal Fire, the Destroyer, Great Beyond, Living Legends, absolutely bonkers. Um, so I think what we could also consider now is like, this is not really a tech, but it's uh, just a really good like way of winning the game, especially as we're curving into our late game threats, which is what this deck wants to do. Atrocity will allow you to kill an ally and deal its damage equal to its power to anything which is pretty cool to put in because if you're playing cards from star shape and we're gonna have these like big dudes that don't always hit the nexus so like we can utilize atrocity to do some over the top damage which in a deck like this makes a lot of sense we're kind of like so far we're seeing this theme of like having some decent early game uh, removal slash tempo tools curving into some again some more premium removal and then having some healing to summon some uh access some big dudes to kind of play to the field and pressure our opponent and then hit them with atrocities over the top. These cards make just a lot of sense. Now let's go back to our Pylon and Shadow Isles. And maybe we'll just consider some more of the cards that we might be missing and do want to consider. Another very good choice to consider here. Ruination, very powerful card from Shadow Isles. Kill all units. This is your Yu-Gi-Oh! Dark Hole. Now obviously we're killing our units too, but this could be just one card that can blow out a lot of mid-range decks on its own like against like any Demacian decks or like some of the Bilgewater decks, aggro decks, you can kind of like blow them out with a Ruination. I might put one of these cards in. 34 out of 40. Probably want to consider some more. Like we'll have a look at our curve, right? Looking at the curve might be important. We're lacking in the four drops. 
So we'll see if we can try and slot in maybe any four drop units because I know we have the box in here, but we might want some like some decent units. There was always the option to try and build an allegiance deck, but allegiance does require you to kind of like have your deck match that region. So when you check the top card of your deck, you get that bonus effect. So we could have like maybe considered that, but I think we already have 12 cards from Shadow Wilds, so probably not something we're going to consider for this one. Uh, Blinded Mystic is a pretty powerful card. Uh, can be pretty good on curve or we'll grant an ally plus one plus one and silence an enemy follower this card's actually not too bad at the moment and it can be good for buffing our champions on curve too maybe i'll slot in three of this card we can consider some combat tricks like bastion to protect our key units but i think in a deck like this where we have a tremendous amount of value bastion might not be as super important because if we do lose aphilios early even though it's a win condition we have some backup plans with star shaping so i don't think i like bastion as much in this deck so i'm looking at loping telescope here and i'm thinking this could be a really good option to kind of like fill out the rest of our deck this will allow us to manifest a celestial that costs three or less or an epic or a multi-region follower it's a decent on curve play on turn two if we whiff as well as kind of like having the ability to kind of like go along with our flexible strategy and then also providing a little bit of tempo and also what's important with some of the invoke cards is that we do have um with some of the bigger ones we need to have actual celestials to activate their effects so having extra ways of finding those invokes is really important now before i kind of like finalize this deck there might be a few number changes i want to make because maybe i miss like cards like solari priestess for example is a really good invoke card that is strictly better than Lunari Priestess in some scenarios because like even though Lunari Priestess has the like Nightfall synergy as well, the Nightfall synergy isn't super relevant here and I think having some Solaris in replace might be good because this consistently finds us a 4, 5 or 6 cost invoke which can be very powerful. So I might change some of the numbers here, I might go take out one Lunari Priestess, put in one Solari, I maybe want to consider uh, taking out one of the Blinded Mystics because it's like this is like a tech card don't want to be overly teched, even though Blind's really good in some matchups. It's overall not the best in heaps. So maybe I go to a 2-2-2-2-2 two, 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 two spread. Seems relatively nice. And I think I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with this deck. So this is going to be our Aphilios Diana deck invoke. We'll go ahead and save that. So cool, we built our deck. What's really important next is to test your deck. And don't just play one game, lose, and go, damn, this deck sucks. Because you're going to need to, at this point, have a lot of patience. Play those games, get those reps in. You maybe need to play a dozen games before you even consider changing some cards. Because I know I know what some people do. They play one game, they lose. Damn, I need to change the cards. Something's not right here. Why am I losing? Do not do that. You need to have some patience. You need to take those L's. You need to get those... Uh, thought processes in behind the reasons that you were losing and not just changing the deck because you lost. So let's go ahead and play a game. We're going to take it into ranked because I'm an absolute giga chad and I have 578 LP. We're going to do our best here. So I'll begin Snuggles playing some Pantheon, Pantheon Zoe. Now this deck notoriously, um, we have some great tools against it. Blinded Mystic in this matchup is going to be really premium because they play some followers that if we silence them, it slows them down quite a lot. We have multiple champions here. We have a Blinded Mystic on curve too. I might keep the curve. One thing I didn't mention when it comes to deck building as well was that like, Runeterra is very unique and that tempo is a massive factor for winning games. So sometimes whether it be control, aggro or mid-range curving out can be just very powerful so here we are we have a diner two diners in hand we're probably just going to play one of them to get tempo <laughs> now i know this deck pretty well and they want to play a but they have a bunch of combat tricks and stuff i don't want to attack here because if i do i'm walking into potential to get blown out so we're just going to pass here for now um Space Sketch is really nice for allowing us to find some cheap cards. Perfect target for Blinded Mystic too. So what we're going to do here is we're going to figure out what card to discard. Because I do want to play Space Sketcher. So I can find some cheap cards for next turn. That can allow us to like either A, 
activate Aphilios, or B, find cards like Equinox or Card Draw. This can allow us to silence a follower. Our opponent has two very key followers here. Let's go ahead and pick that up. So I think what we're going to do here is we're going to pass. This deck wants to be using the combat tricks. So we'll pass there. So now what we can do is we can actually do some really cool combos here. We can go Blinded Mystic to silence a follower. So I think we'll go ahead and do that. Let's get the White Flame Silence. Now ideally, ideally we'd rather be using this later in the game after they've like put on some more effects. But this is ultimately just fine. So we can go ahead and we can potentially Equinox that. Or we could wait for a turn. I think in this scenario, I might just want to wait. We can go ahead and try and... We can actually attempt to try and kill this dragon here. The worst thing that happens here is that my opponent like plays a combat trick in response to this and we kind of accept those getting a hush out is not too bad at all we have a dusk bringer in hand this is actually pretty good for us so we can like kind of like play this cheap flexible card here, which can allow us to activate Aphilios quite effectively next turn. I think we're just going to block like this, right? Opponent's going to Pale Cascade, that's fair enough. And we just accept that. Go ahead and play Philios. And we maybe want Calibrum. So we can start to try and kill these units off. The brighter my light, the stronger your shadow. Now Philios is pretty cool because we can cycle all of our moon weapons. Let's open up with the Calibrum here, try and move this off the field. And we can pick our next one. I think we'll go for Gravitum. Now, if we can manage to play another card this turn, which shouldn't be too difficult at all, we will be able to get access to the next moon weapon that we phase out, which is very cool. We're going to take Crescent Strike here. Unfortunately, we're losing our unit, but that's okay. I think what we'll do here is we're actually going to Equinox. Which completely shuts down this deck. Having the ability to like hit their followers is very good. We have Crescent Strike to keep us nice and safe here. I think what we'll do here is we're going to actually use the Gravitum. Just want to slow down their tempo. And we'll take a, a Crescendum here, I guess. One of the things I'm noticing now when I was deck building is that I didn't give my deck much flexibility in terms of like Aphilios' uh, weapons because uh, one of the cards here is the Crescendum, which will summon a two cost follower from your deck. If it has Nightfall, activate it, which we didn't really give ourselves much options for that. We'll play Priestess here, see if we can start to find some value. We can go for the... I think the Warrior should be good here. And we'll probably play a Spacey Sketcher and get rid of the pedal. I'm going to look for some more Equinoxes. We whiffed on the Equinox. I think I'll take a Moon Silver. Just make my stuff a little bit more cheap. Okay, here comes Solari. Comet's fantastic in this matchup. So we should definitely hold on to that. We now have the ability to Comet and Vile Feast a threat. 
if it has spell shield. Come out from your shadows, demon. Now I I'm convinced that he may or may not actually have any champions at hand. I'm gonna take a slight risk and develop my uh warrior here. He could also pass, which we may consider that. Because he might be sitting on some champions in hand. He's not a Tarek deck. Pantheon's the biggest threat here. Yeah, fair enough. Not too, not too pressured out yet. Oh, Blinded Mystic is a fantastic draw. Looks like he's going to be going for some big open attacks here though. As long as we're not dead, that's kind of what's important. And we have ways of staying alive with star shaping. Looks like he's cycling for his important cards. I am ready. Let's see how dead we may or may not be. We're going to block with our highest HP units to deny as much overwhelm damage as possible. And I think what we want to do now is we actually want to go ahead and blinded and silence some more of their key followers. As you can kind of see, this deck is very much just a reactive deck. And we kind of like try and look for a win condition through star shaping. This might be the turn where we decide to play it. Um, Supernova could be really good. The win condition could be that we just try and remove all of our opponent's units. I think that's very much a respectable way to try and play this game out. So we'll go ahead and we'll play the Supernova now, I think. Uh, the punishment here is that my opponent could have be sitting on a Pantheon. And I'm not going to have any immediate answers to it. But um, if we do survive the one attack from Pantheon, then we could potentially use our Fallen Comet to remove it. But we've had a pretty good read so far that he's like lacking that kind of stuff. And yeah, no Pantheon played. So it's very good for us. And we do know that he's out of Zenith Blades too. So we can take our appropriate blocks here. I think what we do in this situation is we try and trade off with some Pale Cascades. Pale Cascade being just very good here. We're going to play the Moon Silver too to make this one mana. But not only that, we want to activate the Nightfall effect. Which is what's really important here because we get to draw a card. We'll play the one that we reduce the cost of. And we find another star shaping. We'll press the pass button here, see if he has any combat tricks in response. It's important that we do hold back Vile Feast for as long as possible, so we can pop any spell shields with Fallen Comet. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to star shaping here. At this point, I probably need to be considering not just aiming for pure removal, but trying to close out the game sooner. And I think in this matchup, the Immortal Fire gets a little bit more value because uh, the Immortal Fire has multiple lives, which is pretty good. Against that deck, they haven't got the most premium stuff, answers to it. Um, they could have another Hush, they already played one. Should be okay. This looks like a Pale Cascade, maybe. Mm -hmm. So we play the gem there so we can get card draw from Pale. We cry out. 
so there's Pantheon. Um, this is a little bit scary because, like, ideally we need to remove that on site. Because he could potentially rally, but we have some answers to it. And luckily he didn't find Spell Shield, which is very good. Though some of those keywords are utterly nuts, so... So it looks like he's going to rally here. Luckily for us, he's going to get tremendously shut down by Crescent Strike. So that's very big, very, very big for us. I think in this situation, I might just want to like use my Pale Cascade here to draw and stay a little bit mana efficient. And we should use it on this one because it kind of acts as healing against the damage unit as well. Don't think we're going to play this though. Um... A little bit of a scary turn, but we're going to Comet on site. Killing Pantheon is very important. And we'll kind of, we're going to kind of hope that he doesn't draw anymore. <laughs> Try and push some damage here. Stranger. Okay, it looks like he didn't have another Pantheon. Pray, we're praying. Oh boy, we found a vengeance. Hard removal. Premium. Okay, we play the Immortal Fire here. He top decked the Zoe, so I don't think he has another unit. And cool. Oh, Aphilios is a fantastic draw. Premium draw here. It's going to allow us to get some more value and really pop off, especially finding him later in the game. Like, as I mentioned in a deck building thought, he, like, comes in, he's, like, so flexible in that, like, in the early game, he's, like, not as good as he used to be, but finding him late, you can just pop off. And, yeah, the deck felt pretty good. There's probably some improvements I could make, uh, for sure, but just, like, getting a feel for the deck's nice. I mean, it wasn't strictly a completely new archetype, um, but it was a good example of a deck where I thought it would be pretty different to showcase. Build the deck, show you guys kind of, like, the thought process, um, then having a game, game turned to be a little bit, the game turned out to be a little bit more just generic, me explaining the plays, not so much deck building, but um, yeah, having a good understanding of like what the deck wants to do and how to play. So I do kind of hope that like that little gameplay footage there, building the deck, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe helps some of you guys just like explaining some of my thought processes. I know that like we ended up just playing a pretty generic game where we didn't really talk much about the deck building aspect, but I think what's important is to get a feel for the deck, get the reps in, play those games, see what cards are working, what cards aren't, because having the patience is key. Patience is virtue. It's going to help you to become a really good deck builder. And then one day, go to the ladder with your fresh new decks, outplay your opponents because they don't know what's going on. And, you know, it could be very rewarding sometimes not following the tier one decks, the meta decks. It's a very rewarding feeling. And I think it's a really, it's like one of the most fun ways of playing card games. Deck building is just such a great aspect. Anyway, guys, I don't think there's much else for me to say. Get out there, build those new decks. We have new expansions coming out all the times, new cards coming in all the time. So understanding how to build decks is going to help you in the future. So you don't have to wait for those tier one decks. You can build them yourself. Have a great day. My name is Fake Hero. You guys are awesome. Have a good one.